Hello and welcome to lesson 20, the last of 20 lessons in the URSA Campus Breakdown course on Introductory Statistics and Probability. This is Module 5, Additional Topics in Inferential Statistics, Part 2, Analysis of Variance, ANOVA, and Contingency Tables. Let's get started. In this final lesson of the course, we extend our scope of hypothesis testing methodology in two ways. First, we examine how it is possible to compare the means from three or more populations. Then, we look at how qualitative variables can be tested to determine whether or not they are related to each other. The topics covered in this lesson include the following. One-way analysis of variance, or ANOVA, and the F-test for difference between means, and using contingency tables and the chi-squared test for independence or dependence between qualitative variables. In the previous module, we developed a method for comparing the means of two populations based upon testing the hypothesis that the two means are equal. This allowed us to make decisions about whether or not we believe the population means are the same. In many situations, however, we may need to be able to make such decisions where there are more than only two populations to compare. Examples of such scenarios include comparing the growth of a certain variety of plant in various different locations, or comparing the exam performance of statistics students learning the course under several different delivery formats. In the above examples, if there were only two different growing locations to consider, or only two different methods of course delivery involved, then it would be possible to use the t-test, comparing samples from each population, to make decisions about whether we believe the population means are equal or different. The t-test, however, can only compare two means at a time. So when the number of populations to consider is three or more, another type of test is required. The null hypothesis that we are testing in the case of three or more population means is that all of these means are equal versus the alternative hypothesis that they are not all equal. In other words, that at least one mean is different from the others. So we can write this as H0 is that mu1 equals mu2 equals mu3, etc., right up through to mu n for n populations. And HA is that the means are not all equal. It is important to note that where H0 is rejected in the above test, there is no capacity to determine how it is that the means are not all the same. To make decisions about which particular populations are different from whichever other ones requires further testing, either of two means at a time using the t-test as we've seen before, or else via other methods which are left for further study beyond this course. It's also worth pointing out here that the above null hypothesis could technically be tested via a series of individual t-tests as before, which encompasses all of the possible pairings of means from the total number of populations. One serious drawback, however, is that the number of such tests required becomes quite large as the number of populations increases. For example, three tests are required for three populations, six tests for four populations, 10 tests for five populations, and so on. This highlights the need for a simpler method for testing the above hypothesis. In this lesson, we are limiting our consideration to the case where the differences between populations are based upon variations along a single factor variable. For example, in the previous example about plant growth, each different population is defined by its location i.e. where each garden physically is. In the example about exam performance by statistics classes, the distinguishing variable is the specific method of delivery. In other words, we are interested here in seeing if differences in the value of this single factor, for example, growing location or method of course delivery, have any impact upon the dependent variable, which in this case, would be plant growth or exam scores. The null hypothesis assumes that there is no difference across all values of the single factor, while the alternative hypothesis implies 
that at least one variation in that single factor results in a different outcome for the dependent variable. It's possible to consider more than one factor at a time. For example, we could look at plant growth in populations where both location as well as plant spacing are varied, or we could look at statistics exam performance across not only different delivery methods, but also across different exam formats, for example, open-ended or multiple choice, etc. Such multi-factor analyses are logical and methodological extensions of the one-way ANOVA method considered here, and are left for further study beyond this course. The following method is used to conduct a hypothesis test for differences among three or more population means across differences in a single factor. The test proceeds under the following assumptions. First of all, in the populations under consideration, it's assumed that values of the dependent variable of interest tend to follow a normal distribution. Also, it's assumed that across these populations, the variances in values of the dependent variable of interest are all equal which is natural to assume if, according to the null hypothesis, all of the population means are equal. And we also assume that the samples taken from each population are all independent of each other. The hypotheses are, as previously discussed, H0 is that all of the means mu1 through mu n are equal, and HA is that the means are not all equal. And as with other hypothesis tests looked at thus far, a value is selected for the level of significance alpha for the test. These tests are all one-tailed, so alpha equals one minus the level of confidence, one minus LOC. The test statistic for this test is F, which is a continuous random variable that's greater or equal to zero with a distribution based upon two different degrees of freedom. First, there's what's called the numerator degrees of freedom, denoted by df subscript num, or df numerator. And that equals k minus 1, where k is equal to the number of groups, which is equal to the number of different populations being compared. And the denominator degrees of freedom, which is denoted by df subscript den or df denominator is equal to big N minus k where big N is equal to the sum of all of the sample sizes for each of the populations being sampled. So that would equal n1, little n1 through little nk. The general graph of an F distribution is as shown in the slide below. And we can see that because it starts at zero and only goes in the positive direction and it it goes on towards infinity, basically. So it's not bounded at the upper end, but it is bounded at the lower end at zero. It's therefore not symmetrical like the bell-shaped curves we've seen with the Z and T distributions, the, uh, the normal type distributions. So the F distribution is actually a zero or positive only distribution that's skewed and will be generally skewed to the right because of the fact that it's unbounded at the uh, upper end. For a specified value of alpha, the critical value of f is fc equals f at alpha, df numerator, df denominator. Values for fc can be obtained from an f table, which works as follows. The table shown here includes values for alpha equals 0 0.10, 0 0.05, 0 0.025, 0 0.01, and 0 0.005. DF numerator, shown as DF1, values are listed across the top of the table, ranging from 1 to 10, then 15, 20, 30, 40, 50, and 60. For values of DF numerator in between or greater than those listed, round down to the nearest listed value. DF denominator, shown as DF2, values are listed down the second column of the table, with values ranging from 1 to 15, then 20, and so on. For values of DF denominator in between or greater than those listed, round down to the nearest listed value. From the sample data, the obtained value of F is calculated as follows. Step one, for each group sample, calculate the mean 
x bar i and variance s squared i. Step two, calculate the grand mean x, big x bar, which equals the sum of all x over big N. This is the average for all individuals across all groups. Step three, calculate the mean squared variation between groups, ms between, which equals the sum of squares or ss between over df numerator, which equals the sum across all groups of the product of the group size ni times the square of the difference between the group mean and the gram mean, which is x bar i minus big x bar. And that's all over k minus 1. Step 4, calculate the mean squared variation within groups, ms within, which equals ss within over df denominator. This is equal to the sum for all groups of the product of the group size minus 1, so ni minus 1, times s squared i, all over the sum of all groups ni minus 1 which is also equal to the sum of the product of ni minus 1 times s squared i over big N minus k. Step 5. Finally, calculate the obtained value of f. f obtained is equal to ms between divided by ms within. Step 6. If f obtained is greater than fc, then reject h naught i.e. there is significant evidence that not all population means are equal. And if f obtained is less than or equal to fc, then do not reject h0, i.e. there is insu insufficient evidence to suggest that all population means are not equal. And this decision rule is illustrated in the uh, diagram on the slide. Step, finally, step seven. Note, as with other hypothesis tests we have looked at, it's possible to use the p-value method to determine a range of values within which the p-value lies based on the value of f obtained. This allows us to determine what decision would be made with regard to h0, depending on the value of alpha used. In example one, a market gardener sows a certain variety of sunflower seeds in three separate gardens, and the gardener is interested in determining whether the differences in the growing conditions in these gardens has an impact upon the growth rate of these sunflowers. To investigate this, a sample of eight seeds is sowed in each of the gardens with the height of the sunflowers at full maturity measured in meters. The data is shown in the table below. So you can see, we can see in the table here, we've got a table with three columns, uh, one for each of the gardens labeled garden A, garden B, and garden C. And you can see then that the, the data in those columns are the heights in meters of each of the eight uh, seeds that sprout. So we're asked in part A at Level at LOC equals 95%, what we would conclude about whether or not there is any difference in growth rates for these sunflowers among the three garden sites using the critical value method. And then in part B, we're asked to use the p-value method to determine if the conclusion from part A would be different for any common values of LOC. So, to answer part A, we proceed with the F-test as per the method outlined previously. Firstly, the following assumptions are made here. That the heights of the sunflowers tend to follow a normal distribution. That the variances in heights of sunflowers in the three gardens are the same. And that the samples taken from the three gardens are independent of each other. Next, we let mu1, mu2, and mu3 represent the mean heights, respectively, of sunflowers that grow in gardens A, B, and C. The hypotheses for this test, therefore, are as follows. H0 is that mu1 equals mu2 equals mu3. In other words, all three means are equal. And otherwise, HA is that the means are not all equal. Our level of confidence is 95% for this test, so therefore our alpha is equal to 
And so now we proceed to determine our F critical, our FC. So first of all, our alpha is equal to 0 0.05. Our degrees freedom numerator is equal to K minus 1. Now we have three groups here. So we, uh, we have 3 minus 1 equals 2 as our df numerator. And then our df denominator equals big N minus k, which equals 3 times 8, because there's 8 in each group, minus 3, equals 24 minus 3, which equals 21. So our fc, therefore, is equal to f at 0.05, 2, and 21. Now, we note here that the table we're using gives values for df numerator equals 2, but for df denominator equals but for the df denominator, the values jump from 20 to 30. So as per the rule that we discussed previously, we round down to 20. So therefore, the fc that we'll use for this test is f.05, 2, and 20. And you can see how we find that in the table, in the diagram on the slide at right. And that gives us an f critical we'll use of 3.49. The calculation of F obtained proceeds as outlined previously. The table below shows a summary of the raw data with calculated values for the sample means and variances, as well as the grand mean. So we get use and we and we calculate the the group means and variances as we've done previously. And we get values x bar 1 equals 2.81125, x bar 2 equals 3.67375, and x bar 3 equals 3.1875. We use those values to um, calculate the variances for each group. And we end up getting s squared 1 rounding to 0.11764 s squared 2 rounds 2.47014 and s squared 3 rounds 2.55159. Also, the grand mean big X bar is calculated from the X bar values for each group and we get a, X, a grand mean of 3.2 uh, rounds that rounds to 3.22417. So next we, we calculate our MS between and MS within using the formulas that we discussed previously. And we get an MS between rounding to 1.49588 and MS within rounding to 0.37979. And finally, we calculate our F obtained, which equals MS between over MS within. And we end up with a number that rounds to 3.94. And since the, the values in the F table give us values of f to two decimal places, we round our answer to two decimal places, which, which is why we use 3.94. So since our f obtained of 3.94 is greater than our fc of 3.49, we therefore reject h naught that the means are all equal. And therefore, we conclude that there is significant evidence at LOC equals 95% to suggest that this particular variety of sunflowers does not grow to the same average height in all three of gardens A, B, and C. In part B, if we look at the section of the F table corresponding to DF numerator equals 2 and DF denominator equals to 20, and you can see the extract from the table below, if you look up df1 equals 2 and df2 equals 20, there's actually a section uh, showing uh, the p-values from 0 0.005 through 0 0.10 with the f-values that correspond to those p-values. And we see here that our f obtained of 3.94 falls between f equals 3.49, which corresponds to a p-value of 0.05, and f equals 4.46, which corresponds to a p-value of 0 0.025. So therefore, we can conclude that our p-value is between 0 0.025 and 0 0.05. Therefore, we would make the same decision to reject h naught at all alpha greater or equal to 0 0.05, and that includes common alpha such as 0 0.05, 0 0.1, etc. And we would make the opposite decision, in other words, to not reject h naught at all alpha less than or equal to 0 0.025, which includes such common alpha as 0 0.025, 0 0.01, 0 0.005, etc. 
A final note here. When we reject H0, we're only able to conclude that not all of the population means are equal to each other. In other words, that sunflowers do not grow to equal average heights in all of gardens A, B, and C. We are able to conclude within a, a level of confidence such as 95% that sunflowers from garden B with the greatest sample mean grow higher than those from garden A with the lowest sample mean. The F test here, however, does not provide us with a basis to make any conclusions about populations whose sample values fall in the middle. In this case, the sunflowers of garden C. In other words, we are unable here to address whether sunflowers in garden C grow to the same average height as in garden A or in garden B or somewhere in between. In order to derive any such further and more precise conclusions, we would need to either conduct t-tests between specific pairs of samples or else use another type of test on all of these samples together, the latter being a subject for further study beyond this course. In the previous part of this lesson, we introduced the ANOVA method, which allows us to evaluate the effect of a qualitative single factor variable for example, garden location, on the resulting value of a quantitative variable, such as the height of a sunflower. The ANOVA method, however, does not provide us with a means to evaluate the relationship between two qualitative variables. For example, we might be interested in whether or not there is any significant difference between rural versus urban residents' attitudes towards retaining the monarchy. In this example, we are considering two different qualitative variables. Firstly, community type with possible values rural or urban. And secondly, attitude towards monarchy with possible values against, being against, neutral, or for. Now in this example, there's no particular measurement made of individuals other than categorizing them into a particular community type, rural or urban, and into a particular attitude towards the monarchy, against, neutral, or for. Despite the lack of any quantitative aspect to the variables in question, we can actually employ a quantitative method to determine whether they are independent or dependent variables with respect to each other. In other words, we can address the question of whether or not community type and attitude towards the monarchy are somehow linked. The following example illustrates this method. In example two, 400 adult, adult Canadian residents, including 100 from rural communities and 300 from urban communities, were randomly selected and asked if they were against, neutral, or for retaining the monarchy. The results are shown in the table below on the slide. In part A, we're asked to perform a test at LOC equals 95% that determines if Canadian residents' attitudes towards retaining the monarchy and whether they are from rural versus urban communities are independent of or dependent upon each other. And in part B, we're asked to use the p-value method to determine if there are any common values of LOC for which the decision in part A would be reversed. So to address the question of whether community type and attitude towards the monarchy are independent or dependent, we start by looking at the given data table which shows how the individual sampled fell into the various categories of both community type and attitudes towards the monarchy. Such a table is called a contingency table. In the contingency table here, we can see that there are two categories of community type, rural and urban, and three categories of attitude towards the monarchy, against, neutral, and four. There are therefore two times three equals six cells in the table one for each possible simultaneous combination of community type and attitude towards the monarchy. In general, we can say that for a contingency table with two variables, where one variable has M categories in rows and the other variable has N categories in columns, the total number of cells equals M times N. The numbers in each of these cells are called the observed values for each combination of possible values for the two variables. An observed value in the ith row and jth column is denoted by O subscript ij, or simply OIJ. 
For example, of the 400 people surveyed, there were 58 rural residents who said that they were against retaining the monarchy. And this is re represented by 011 or 01 comma 1, which equals 58. Meanwhile, the 94 urban respondents who indicated they were for retaining the monarchy is shown as 023, which equals 94. At the end of each row is the row total for that row, which represents the total number of observations for that row's value for the first variable. Similarly, at the bottom of each column is the column total for that column, which is the total number of observations for that column's value for the second variable. The row totals and the column totals should both add up to the grand total, which is the total number of all observations and is located in the very bottom right corner of the table. In a test for independence or dependence between two variables, we are trying to determine whether the relative distribution of values across one variable is about the same across the values of the other variable, in which case they would be independent or significantly different, in which case they would be dependent. In other words, for this example, we want to see if the breakdown of attitudes about the monarchy is more or less the same for rural versus urban respondents, or if there is in fact a significant difference in this breakdown between the two types of communities. To make this determination, we make the initial assumption that the two variables are independent and then we calculate the values for each cell that we would expect if this was really the case. For example, we know that of the 400 total people surveyed, 100 of them are from rural communities. This represents a proportion of rural respondents equal to 100 over 400, which works out to be 1 over 4, or 0 0.25. And similarly, the proportion of urban respondents equals 300 over 400, which equals 3 over 4, or 0 0.75. We also know that out of the total of 400 people surveyed, there are a total of 193 respondents who indicated they were against retaining the monarchy. Therefore, if community type and attitude towards the monarchy were indeed independent of each other, the breakdown of these 193 people along the rural versus urban categories should be based solely on the relative proportions of these categories as calculated above. In other words, we would expect the following breakdown in the against column. We would have rural and against equaling 100 over 400 times the 193, which equals 48.25, and urban and against equals the 300 over 400 times 193, which equals 144.75. And notice that those two numbers we calculated must add up to 193. The values we have just calculated are called the expected values for these cells, based upon the assumption of independence between the variables. An expected value for the cell in the i row and j column is denoted by EIJ. So for example, the expected values we have just calculated above are E11 equal to 48.25 and E21 equals 144.75. In general, the formula for calculating all expected values for a contingency table can be written as EIJ equals the row I total times the column J total divided by the grand total. The expected values for the entire table here are therefore calculated as follows. We get E11 equals 100 times 193 over 400, which equals 48.25. E12 equals 100 times 96 over 400 equals 24. E13 equals 100 times 111 over 400 equals 27.75. E21 equals 300 times 193 over 400 equals 144.75. E22 equals 300 times 96 over 400 equals 72. And E13 equals 300 times 111 over 400 equals 83.25. These expected values are added and they're shown in brackets in the table alongside their corresponding observed values. 
to make up the what's called the augmented contingency table, which is shown in the slide below. So you can see that next to the raw data values in the cells, we've got in brackets the expected values written into the table. And notice that the totals of the expected values have to add up to the row and, common to row and column totals respectively, just like the observed values, which are the raw data. If we look at the augmented contingency table above in the slide, we can see that there are differences between the observed and expected values in each cell. Now, while it is possible to get observed values that are equal to expected values, at least for one or several cells, in reality, this is usually not the case, even if the two variables in question are indeed independent of each other. And this is due as we have previously seen throughout this course, to nothing more than random sampling error. However, if the two variables are truly independent, then we can expect that the differences between observed and expected values should be relatively small. Meanwhile, if the two variables are in fact dependent, we would expect that these differences would be relatively larger. To make some sort of a definitive determination of independence or dependence, then, we can apply a statistical test to these differences along the lines of the other hypothesis tests we have conducted previously. The method we employ here is called the chi-squared test, and it is outlined as follows. Firstly, the hypotheses here are H0, that the two variables are independent of each other, and HA, that the two variables are dependent upon each other. Now, as with other hypothesis tests looked at thus far, a value is selected for the level of significance, alpha, for the test. These tests are all one-tailed, so we use alpha equals 1 minus LOC. The test statistic we use for this test is what's called chi-squared, and it's a positive value only continuous random variable like f with a distribution based upon degrees of freedom defined as df equals m minus 1 times n minus 1, where m and n are the number of rows and columns respectively in the contingency table as discussed previously. Now the expression for degrees of freedom here relates to the fact that for a given set of totals for each of the rows and columns respectively there are m minus 1 and n minus 1 of the cell values that are free to vary the general graph of a chi-square distribution is similar in shape to that for the f distribution and you can see a diagram here showing what that looks like it's a distribution that starts it's bounded on the lower end at zero and then is unbounded at the upper end. For a specified value of alpha, the critical value of chi-squared is chi-squared c equals chi-squared for alpha and df. Values for chi-squared c can be obtained from a chi-squared table such as the one shown here, which works as follows. The columns are for values of alpha equal to from 0.995 down to 0 0.005. And for this particular test, we use the smaller half of these values, which correspond to LOC values in the range from 90% up to 99.5%. And DF values are listed from one onwards down the rows. From the sample data, the obtained value of chi-squared is calculated as follows. Chi-squared obtained equals to the sum over all cells of the square of OIJ minus EIJ divided by EIJ. If chi-squared obtained is greater than chi-squared C, then we reject H0, i.e. there is significant evidence that the two variables are not independent. And if chi-squared obtained is less than or equal to chi-squared C, then we do not reject H0, i.e. there is insufficient evidence to suggest that the two variables are not independent. In other words, suggesting that the variables are independent. Note, oh, and we see uh, on the slide here, a diagram for this decision rule. 
Finally, note that the p-value method can be used alternatively as we have done with other such hypothesis tests. We now conduct the chi-squared test for this example. So, for part A, H0 is that attitude towards retaining the monarchy is independent of the type of community in which a person resides. HA is attitude towards retaining the monarchy is dependent upon the type of community in which a person resides. Our LOC here is 95%, so our alpha for one tail test equals 1 minus 0.95 equals 0 0.05. So our chi-squared chi -squared critical we look up in the table is equal to the chi-squared for 0 0.05 Alpha equals 0 0.05, and our degrees of freedom is calculated from our numbers of rows and columns. So our DF equals 2 rows minus 1 times 3 columns minus 1 gives us 1 times 2 equals 2. So we're looking for chi squared uh, uh, at 0 0.05 and 2, which you can see in the extract on the slide below, is equal to 5.991. So then we go ahead and use the data in our augmented contingency table and calculate chi-squared obtained, which we can see in the slide here works out to be 8.235, and we round to three decimal places because the chi-squared C values in the table are also rounded to three decimal places. So now we can see that our chi-squared obtained of 8.235 is greater here than our chi-squared C of 5.991. So therefore, we reject H0. And therefore, we conclude that there is significant evidence at LOC equals 95% to suggest that a person's attitude towards retaining the monarchy is dependent upon the type of community in which they reside. In part B, if we look at the section of the chi-squared table corresponding to DF equals 2, so we look into the DF equals 2 row, and we can see that chi-squared obtained equals 8.235 falls between values of 7.378, which corresponds to a p-value equal to 0 0.025, and 9.210, which corresponds to a p-value of 0 0.01. So therefore, our p-value is between 0 0.01 and 0 0.025. So therefore, we would make the same decision to reject H0 at all common alpha greater or equal to 0 0.025, such as alpha equal to 0 0.025, 0 0.05, 0 0.1, etc. And we would make the opposite decision, i.e. to not reject H0 at all common alpha less than or equal to 0 0.01, such as alpha equal to 0 0.01, 0 0.005, etc. I hope that you found this video helpful. If you liked it and would like to see more from MRSA Campus, then please subscribe. And also, if you'd like to send your feedback, that's always welcome too. Thanks for watching, and I wish you well with your studies.